Hello, everybody. Um, we have 40 minutes, so and we have like 50 years to go through, so we're going to do it pretty quickly. There is going to be a 10-minute reel, but since they release every movie, we decided we were just going to jump into questions. Okay. So um, let's just begin with the very beginning. It's 1980. You're both young. You're still very young, but you're both younger at that time. Um, you're working at United Artists. Um, what's happening in the world at that time, in the film industry? I mean, I, I know what was happening in the world, but... Well, the only thing I have to say about the macro was when Jaws opened on thousands of screens on the weekend and then Star Wars opened two years later, all of a sudden the studios were rethinking being in the independent film business or the foreign language film business. And so United Artists Classics uh, was created and they, they brought in Tom to run it, uh, created... So he was your boss at the time? I yeah. had to shave my beard. That was the deal. <laughs> I Well, actually, I was at United Artists already renting 16-millimeter films to colleges and that kind of thing. Wow. And so we had met before, but Tom was crafting United Artists Classics. We, we met before at the Secret Santa party where we had to pick a, a name out of a hat to give a gift, and we picked each other, and that's where that's we That's how we met. So, 79. And, and so you, you, you were friends then? No, we knew each other. We just but, knew each other. So, but I mean, so, but, but then, three years later, you co-founded Orion Classics. Right. So you must become friends over a course of three years. Yes, this is how it happened. Okay. Tom basically said to me, "I have what you don't have. You have what I don't have. Let's do this together, and we'll be totally." And equal. what was that? What What did you have? Eddie? I don't know. You, Tom, can comment. On Other that. than a, I mean, <laughs> cowboy. He said it. <laughs> uh, well. I, at Films Inc., there was a movie called The Shout. I was hired there. Guy said, uh, a guy named Seth Willinson, who's dead, said, okay, I want you to come over and start an independent film company. And two weeks into the job, he, died, he had quit. And so it was me and my secretary with a, a library of uh, old ABC films like Zachariah and whatnot, and The Shout. And so we just as changed the rules. We, we that was pre-UA. UA, we didn't do the ad agency. We, we just did everything our way. And Michael had left and gone to UA, to the non-theatrical, which was a big business back then. It was 16 millimeter rentals to all the colleges. And it was a very, you know, very lucrative business. And this guy, Than Quit, said, I want to start a business where it's specialized film. And, you know, Louis Malls, uh, Atlantic City was out and whatnot. And, and Michael knew more about film than anybody I knew. And so we came there, our first movie was The Last Metro, and we had to get rid of all the people that were there that were doing the repertory, and so Michael was the ultimate person to be the first person to come over there. And from there on, we found a few companies. And, 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 or, I mean, yeah, and you founded three companies, and uh, one of which you stayed forever and ever, but when you set up Orion Classics in 1983, the move, where do you, where did, was there a hole in the market? Was there, why, where, would, where did you see an advantage in creating a new company? Well, what, what the advantage was, Arthur Krim and Eric Kleskow, who had run United Artists for 27 years, was the king of not only the big Bond movies and so forth, but also independent movies. And they saw the independent movies had to be a different business. And they were, we, they courted us to come over there. And Krim was a real genius and was really into giving directors final cut and all of these things. And so we, we went to Orion and he liked the fact we started at United Artists Classics because he came from there as well. And so that was a great company to work for where the director was always king. And uh, it w there was a space, there was definitely a space for independent film because by that time, uh, we and others had crafted this idea of releasing films in a cost-effective way, which the studios could not do. Well, right. ba back then, it was, you know, UA had made movies like, uh, oh, God. Um, well, no, no, he made these smaller movies that they didn't know what to do with, that they turned into, like, La Caja Paul and, and films like that, and they, they made a lot of money, and there was a repertory business that was a really good business at the time. And they made the French version of Black Cage Yeah. Yes. Yeah, they did. UA Finance, that was yeah. Arthur Cram. 
and um, Eric Pleskow. They Preskow. did all those. They did Truffaut's films. They, they did so they, many. They had a group called Lopert Films, which did these movies and went around the world. Patrick's right. Did Tom Jones. Uh, yeah, they did to it. Tom Patrick, Jones. by the way, you're not allowed to speak, so yeah. wherever you are, yeah, you have to be quiet. Thank you. So, so anyway, so... It's not because you're in a suit that suddenly you have, like, privileges. Yeah, he had that on last year. We'll but, do one for you next year about your life, which is not as exciting as their life, okay? I don't think he ever sold it. He already his did one on his life a few years ago. Yeah. <laughs> I can, I can, we can talk about Patrick Waxberger. He was um, Serge Gainsbourg's driver. Um, that's how he started. He knew Jerry Lewis. And then, then yeah, then he, then, then he actually uh, worked we with Jerry, Jerry Lewis, Lewis for 25 years. There we go, <laughs> Patrick Waxberger, everybody. Please applaud. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, anyway, what happened was all the theaters wanted the special product, you know, as for that was coming out through the studios, and like La Caja Fall played for like a year in a lot of places. And so we started to feed those guys. And, and we would have bidding wars where one theater would bid $100,000 to play the movie because they would have these longevity runs when we had, you know, our, our high end films. You can films. keep a movie in theaters in, for a year. A yeah. year. You, you literally were able to yes. keep a movie in the theater for a year. Many. It was okay, a well, here's the thing. We have run out of time. And okay. um, it was great to meet you, too. It was good. But, uh, uh, <laughs> so. So it's 1992. We've got many, many years to go through. So okay. let's keep it going. You you create Sony Pictures classics, and I have to say, you know, it's it's an amazing thing when you think that you know they they met in 1980, and um, and what like 75 years later, you guys are still working together, and uh, and it takes a lot because you know m most of me and my colleagues want to kill each other every day, and it's it's it's. Uh, it's impressive that you haven't done it yet. Similar um, daily, yeah. the last ones. <laughs> so, in 1992. Here's what happened. Sony always wanted a quality brand film label, even right. before they bought Columbia. When we were at Orion, they courted us, but we said we wanted to stay at Orion. Orion filed for bankruptcy, and we said, okay, now we'll come over. <laughs> and Peter Goober invited us over, and he knew the Japanese. And it had to do with this guy, it. John Kluge, and his divorce. That, uh, like, that Orion went bankrupt, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But the thing is, um, the, the Japanese were so interested, and they still are, this idea of quality of brand, this idea that the talent, uh, if the talent comes to your brand and wants to go to your brand, you're going to be good long term, and right. they thought very long term, which is why we're still there and have the library. And so the whole when thing. you when you got there, I mean, and you you know you're a pretty decisive bunch. Um, what filmmakers were driving you? Who did you want? What well, you want here's to here's with? the here's the thing that really set us off. At Orion, we put money in and, and sort of almost co-produced Howard's End with Ishmael Merchant. And that was our big movie. That was going to take us to another level. And then the bankruptcy hit. And we both had contracts where we Hurts. couldn't leave. And it was an asset to the bankruptcy. And so the guy who was the in charge of the company now was running the bankruptcy it confided in me that he, he knew a lot about art movies. And I said, great. Well, what, what's your favorite? And he said, well, I, I've seen Pink Flamingos. <laughs> and so we went, great. And so Ishmael... Um, said, listen, I'll buy the movie back from you guys, and when you go to the new place, I'll sell it to you. And so we showed it to the bankruptcy court. They looked at it. Uh, I think Michael made the call, and they asked Michael who Howard was, and Ishmael yeah. bought it back. That's how I knew we were going to win that film back to Sony, because the bankruptcy guy said, who's Howard? And we opened it three weeks later yeah. at Sony Classics. That's right. And that was your first movie? Yes. Yeah. And we had invested in it. But I... I I, I do have a Harvey Weinstein story with that, which I've never told before. Well, maybe which you is should that tell one that story. Ismail, when Ismail uh, took the film out, Harvey Weinstein demanded to see the film, and by the law with the bankruptcy and all that, he deserved the ability to buy it from Ismail, but it was Ismail's call. So they, 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 uh, Harvey Weinstein and team went to a screening at our Orion office, the first screening of the film, and... And I was there as they left the screening, and there was Harvey, went up to Ismail. Ismail hated Harvey Weinstein. They, he threw things at him. Harvey threw something at him, and that was it. But what, what happened they were was, throwing things at what each happened other. was, yes. he, uh, how Harvey said, I'll give you $5 million for that movie. 
And Ismail said, no, we're going with them at Sony. I only did this as a pro And we're only pharma. taking $1 million. And that's what, he's, what happened was, you mean to say you're going to take $5 million from these guys that are leaving a bankrupt company? He said, no, it's worse than that. I'm taking $1 million. But I've never seen See how I know so the like... pricing and has not changed in 30 years. <laughs> well, and Ishmael, Ishmael got quite a bit of money back in overage on that movie. Oh, yeah. He made a lot of money on that film, Ishmael. Also um, a recurring theme. And, but um, what other filmmakers were you, like, really interested well, in? Well, Almodovar, beginning? we had the world on um, uh, world, a Women on the Verge of a Nervous Breakdown. And he went away for a few films. And then he came back to us, and we have had him ever since. Ever since. Yeah, he, was, he is a through line for us. James Ivory and Ismail Merchant were great. Louis Malle was really great until, unfortunately, he passed away. Um, who were some of the others? We've had lots. Uh, we had Nicole some, Hall of Center. We had some, uh, we had Sally some Romares there. Potter. Sally Potter. Oh, yeah, the Romares are very interesting. When we couldn't get arrested and we didn't want to pay any money in Orion, we knew that Romare always got a great New York Times and Village Voice review, no matter how good or bad the film was. So we made a deal with the Romare producer because we knew the productions cost like $2.50. We said we will buy every one of them for hundred that grand. I think we had six in a row. Right? Yeah, we'd say, we'd like you to, Eric, could you come to the States and talk to people? He says, why would anyone want to talk to me? Why I'm not going to want to see my movies. Yeah. That's what he was like. So, but but uh, we graduated in, at Sony. You know, the first several years, we won a lot of Oscars for... Uh, wait, 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 wait. We're going to get to the Oscars okay. because I know I know you want to talk about how many Oscars you won. No, I don't want to talk about that. <laughs> I don't want to talk about that, but that was... What was interesting about that is that was important to the Japanese at that time to settle the quality brand. So, Not us. No, of course you don't care about... Michael doesn't ever talk about Oscars. Um, so, 30 years later... You're both still alive and kicking. Yeah. Independent film, I, I still believe, is alive and kicking. And Sony Pictures Classic is, is doing very well. Um, what's changed? You have to change every minute. In other words, to, to, to be able to do this for 45 years, you've got to see what's happening every week and adapt to that. And that's, we always wanted to be these guys. We always wanted to release quality movies from around the world and, and, and be in the world of filmmakers and be in the world of getting as many people as we can to see these movies. And so to do that, the amount of changes that came from when we started and there was just a telephone you know, in a telex machine to now, We've had to keep up with those trends, and we've had to keep up with the trends in terms of how films change and the people's tastes change. Because if we don't change with that taste, and we, you know, there are moments we can point to where we go, oh shit, that movie, things have changed, we gotta move on, there's new things happening. And so just being immersed in the culture and, and being able to figure out how the audience is gonna find our movies and how we can get to them and get them to react to them is the key to, I think, what we've done for so long and also, when we buy a movie, people go, oh, how did you know about that one? Well, me and Michael will look at a movie, and if we think we can make it work and we like it, we'll buy it. If other people may not see what we see, but maybe because... Remember that one, Rogue? You said, you don't Robert want that Robert. movie, do you? <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, we took it for I, I a lot of money, honest, right? We're not going to give a title to that movie. All right. All right. Uh, <laughs> anyway, so... But, so, but the point also, in addition to that, not only do we want the highest box office gross we can get, but it's this idea of a long tail, a movie that keeps giving, and we have proof of that. This November, Sony Pictures is coming out with this 11 ultimate box set of 4Ks of the movies that have stood the test of time and still do a lot of business on streaming and television. There are things that range from SLC Punk to Crouching Tiger to Run Lola Run to, to films you would, like City of Lost Children, which was a disaster when it opened, and now is a huge so profit. Yeah. yeah. So it has a lot to do with that philosophy that you can trust in the long tail, and also have those distribution outlets, which Sony has very well. So you you, you forgot a you, you got Pedro. I mean, you obviously work with Luca Guadagnino. Oh yeah. Yeah, you forgot about that one. Um, you worked, Woody Allen also. That's great. Um, I was going to actually skip Woody Allen for this interview, but... Um, it's all right. We had a lot okay. of Woody movies, and they were some yeah, pretty yeah, good ones. Yeah, you, you did, um, but I was going to skip that. Okay. And um, we're not ashamed of Woody. Again, I can hear you, Patrick. Kurosawa. Kurosawa. You had that, Wait, but you, you, had, you had Link later. Rich Link, that, we had Slacker, his first film. Spike Lee. 
Spike Lee, yeah. Guillermo del Toro. Oh, yeah. Devil's Backbone is also in that 11 set. And now that you know Guillermo was, he's a big success. Go back and watch that. It's incredible. Um, I, so I'm, I'm happy I can remind you of some of these filmmakers that you worked with. Um, it, who, who is your fil favorite filmmaker? If you, if you had to leave all of them and just be with one of them, hopefully the answer is not Woody Allen, but... <laughs> Dead or alive? Really? Well, I'm asking, dead or alive? Uh, alive. A dead, probably. I mean, I mean, alive too. Which one? Louis Ma was one of my best friends, and and I I loved having meals with him. And Tom make fun of us of who would end the meal first because it would they last ate five really oh fast. Oh my God, they and, must have been so slowly. <laughs> and fast. And uh, Guillermo del Toro is one of the greatest conversationalists you'll ever meet in your life. I could just sit there forever with that guy. Um, I don't know. There were so many we like. What about you? Ang Lee was my favorite. Oh, yeah. yeah. You know, going through Crouching Tiger with Ang from the beginning to end. Amazing. No more. I've never met a guy as incredible as Ang and as humble and as smart and, uh, you know, and as loyal and as friendly. And he's know? alive and you'd like to get his next movie. Always. Always. Um, so you're one of the rare companies that champion foreign language films from the very, very beginning, as you've described, and you were talking about Crouching Tiger. With me, you did Capernaum. Um, how, do you, how do you pick up these foreign films that, that could work you know, domestically in a world pre-Netflix where people were reading subtitles? I mean, how do you justify it financially when you know, no one would read subtitles and how do you get those movies in the field? I'm going to give you a subtitle story. Just Crouching Tiger, I believe, changed the world of subtitles because when we came out, it was right when they started to do the news feed below. And before that, you, you've asked somebody how you read subtitles. Some people read them fast. Some people look up and down. It just never could stick as something that, you know, was just watching the movie and you don't even think about them. Right. But Crouching Tiger, people came out of there, they didn't even know it had subtitles. It was, uh, you know, it was pure action. It was pure action. That's true. But there was a romance. There was a teenage romance. Yeah. But uh, since then, people don't really, you never hear that subtitle problem. That was, that was the, the, for the longest time, like the biggest foreign language. It is language. still the biggest foreign language film in history by three times. Even more than Parasite? Yes. Really? Tom, I know you're out there someplace. I'm sorry. Um, you can always try later. One hundred and twenty-eight million dollars in the U.S. alone. You're talking about the. You're talking about the, your target demographic when you actually buy one of these foreign language movies. All right. Um, well, I want to talk, say something about what's happening now because what's happening now when you buy foreign language films is you have to be very selective. It is harder than ever as far as these uh, smaller films because a lot of these critics don't have the cachet they used to have to get the audiences in. But right now what's happening is during the pandemic, uh, a, a younger audience uh, has grown for these movies. We saw it this last year with movies like Parallel Mothers or Worst Person in the World. And it was the younger audience that turned out because the older audience is still slow in coming back. So I think what we're, we're seeing a hope for uh, the foreign languages the films because this younger audience is going to augment that older audience coming back. However, you still have to be more selective than ever and get those three or four that do cross over every year, which is, is a problem for those smaller foreign languages. Well, I mean, here, here's the problem. The problem is there used to be a newspaper, there'd be an ad, there would be a critic that was somewhat intelligent, and every week they would write about movies. So you actually became a fan. You started to follow them. Foreign language films were always in the mix, so you could always try something different. And then that went away. And now there's no place that you can go to really have that happen on a regular basis in your life. Everybody picks a, a different place. So the thing that really puts the spotlight on the foreign language films right now are, are the awards. And, and you, know, you look at a lot of the movies every year. If you looked at those movies and they weren't in that award thing, many times they wouldn't see the light of day. So the Academy Foreign Language uh, Group has really, that spotlight has become a really go for important, kind of place. Important thing. Um, yeah, it does, it does feel that, I mean, not that 
me agreeing with you means anything. But the other thing on this foreign language film issue, it's also the long tail. You have to trust it. Like, I trust in the long tail on Capernaum, a very difficult film, getting the market for it. Unfortunately, it was the same year as Roma, which kicked our ass. But the fact of the matter we is... also had like 57 the, But I was happy spend. because Roma's great. But the point is... In ad money. Capernaum... Little that's bit, right. A little, little bit more than us. <laughs> yeah. But Capernaum, though has that quality, has that long tail. Nadine's gonna be making more movies. So it's, it's, you have to think in terms of that when you're dealing with foreign language films. But I'll tell you something that's good as far as our experience with foreign language films. When the pandemic started and these platforms like HBO Max started and, and Disney Plus and so forth, uh, we were nervous and thought, oh, well, they're not going to be interested in foreign language films at all. But it's turned out they are, and we've been able we to... We weren't that nervous. Sony. I mean, I, I mean I, but there are, like, you know, criterions coming up. Always. Movies coming up. Yeah. I mean, but the you, fact that your the bigger ones are also also buying them, like HBO Max with the older Almodovars, it's a right, very right, right. positive thing. What we did, when the, when the COVID hit, the, that week when we were said, okay, it said in the paper closed we organized all our titles into categories and gave it to the tv guys and, and all our movies sort of I, our goal is to brand a movie so that you know you, you're going to think see that movie 10 years from now and go oh, i remember that i heard about that one yeah. city of lost children something like that and so we did that and they went to all the services with like a, a slate and we you know we sort of put the, the good ones on the top and lo and behold they appeared everywhere because there's really never a place where you could get the foreign language films and a lot of the smaller films into the sort of the pay deals. And so this was like brand new fodder for these guys to be able to put up there to attract, you know, a segment because they're all looking for different segments of the audience. So that really brought a lot of our library back in, into the light. And I think if it was a resurgence in the, in the specialized in foreign... So you don't see them as competitors at all, and actually it's helped, it's helped grow your business in a weird way. I think so. We think so. Who's, I mean, but who I is, tell you... Who big, are your competitors? I don't, we don't really look at it that way. We just do the best well, we can, make he, the most... Here's the deal. Back in the 80s, we had a lot of competitors. Yeah. Back in the 90s, we had a bunch of competitors. I don't think you can point to one company now that's the same. So I don't know who you can compete with. Everybody's got a whole different deal going on. Everyone's some people are, agendas. you know, streamers and day and date. Some people, uh, you know, are feeding direct TV. Some people are, you know, just specializing in small distribution. It, there, that's the thing. There is no single uniform way things are done. You right. can look at Focus or Fox Searchlight and what they used to be, what they are now. Different. You know, you know, one of the advantages to being at Sony right now, Sony does not have a platform. So as Tom Rothman describes it, we're the best go. arms dealers in the business because we can sell to everyone and anyone all of our pictures, the streamers. But we're into theatrical first. Yes. Theatrical is always primary because you want to brand the picture so people remember it later on at worst. At best, you do box office as well. Movie stars are made on the screen, not in the stream. Oh, that, that'll be quoted in Deadline for sure. <laughs> <laughs> My God. Uh, Tom, well, I never heard that one. And, and that's, that, Pretty good. That was, that was good. That was really good. Uh, Patrick, do you have anything to add to that one? No? Um, so, um, well, you, you answered a lot about the pandemic and, I, and how it changed the structure of your deals and everything. You were still buying movies during the pandemic, even though you are, you've never wavered from being a purely theatrical company. Um, was there a moment during the pandemic you're like, I, our business is dead beyond? Never. Never. We, we bought more movies. We had such, we had such better deals during the pandemic because nobody else was buying. That, that's tr And again, some innovative stuff. We, we, okay, how are we gonna make money with these movies? And so instead of going on breaks with some of the films, we, we used the PVOD as our break. Because at least we did on the father. Yeah. You know, when the pandemic started, there were there were people knocking on our doors to buy streamers to buy the father, and we just knew that if we we waited this thing out, the father would have that reputation. Um, that photographer really confused us. Um, 
so we talk. I mean, literally, you know, just by you talking, you've answered like every one of our questions. This is great because we're kind of running out of time. Um, I, you want to show the real? Congratulate Patrick uh, no, Waxberger. We're, we're not going to watch the it Oscar it. for best picture. Well, I want to congratulate Patrick uh, yeah, Waxberger. Congr- on winning he the did Oscar win Coda. So yeah, I always wanted to ask you, where do you keep the Oscar? Uh, in my bedroom. <laughs> it's, it's, it's actually locked in my bedroom. It's. it's um, but um, so looking ahead. Um, just a few more questions. Um, what do you regret? What do we regret? Yeah, what do you regret? Don't pretend you don't regret anything. I don't know. I do, but I just... I mean, Woody Allen, probably. Michael's got a lot of regrets. He's not going to tell you. <laughs> but there are always movies that we didn't get, but yeah. we always never lost money on a movie we didn't buy. Well, that's <laughs> <laughs> another great quote. That quote... Was originally Arthur Crims. He told Tom, and he always remembers it. So stealing from the dead. Um, Tacked you down. Son. He was a pretty good guy. So you so you regret nothing. No, I'm, we must regret something. <laughs> um, there was that night. I regret our cafeteria, but that's not. <laughs> that's a, uh, um, it's it's in movies that you just didn't see. You know, there's movies that you know you just don't see them. I mean, Steven uh, Soderbergh's. Uh, right, you, Tom is right. There were movies we'll go. We don't know how to sell that movie. And it turns out to be a huge hit, but we didn't know, so we didn't. Sex lies and videotape to this day. It. I have no idea why that worked, but you know, it was a hit. A mistake. It, it, was, it was a really good movie. Yeah, I, you know, I, I that's, just didn't that's see probably it. Probably why it worked. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe. Um, so, it, you know, you, you've done it for, and I'm, of course you're not going to answer this question honestly, but um, um, if you had to do it again, would you do it again together for this long? Yeah. Really? I think so. I mean, My, listen. Michael, Michael seems to not really no, agree. Maybe. Well, you can ask no, maybe. No, you know, I would shape. definitely do it again. The thing is, uh, Tom and I are a great combination. You know, as Tom says, he's never afraid of anything. I sometimes am afraid. And that Tom's big gift is that he says, when something goes wrong, there's always plan B. And you have no idea how great it is to be standing next to someone like that as you go through life. But I find that films have all the people in this room, films shape our lives in some way. I'm an extreme version of that from the time I was a kid. So I can't imagine doing anything else because films raised me. You know, my parents didn't, films did. And so- Let's not quote that that either, but um, um, wait, so what, I'm truly, for for people that work together and um, what's the secret to, to this long-term relationship. Well, I mean, what, how, how do you not kill each other? Because it's, it's difficult. Well, what do you want out of your thing? Do you want to be the king? You know, we, we don't want to be the king. The movies are the king. So right there, that takes out a whole lot of problems. Uh, does Michael want a movie I don't want? Well, we, we argue it out. Yes, you do. And, uh, Quite you know, annoying, actually. some it lasts for weeks. Yeah, some do, some don't. But, you know, you're trying to show how this movie can work in the marketplace. And, you know, and it's a discussion and we both know each other's strengths and weaknesses. So, you know, you can you can talk about it and say, maybe you see that in it, maybe you don't. Or maybe, you know, you, know, it's, you, you never come to the conclusion that you want to spend the big money. But it's, it's sort of, you know, the answer always comes between the two of us, whether right. it's like... One convinces the other. We're looking at a trailer, you know, and you go, you know, because we, 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 we always stayed involved in everything. And in the, in the, 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 the bookings, the, the, the trailers, the, still all the minutia of, of the business, which is, you know, how I think we can make this stuff work in a very inexpensive way. But you go, my God, I don't know how to hell this trailer. And Michael will see something and go, you know, this is the way we should do it. Or I know that Michael's going to know this subject way more than I, and he's going to take the lead on a lot of the stuff that's going to happen, and, and vice versa. So, I mean, we know... It feels like you release a movie and he has the parties, right? <laughs> he likes to go to dinner. <laughs> <laughs> he really does. So, um, what, what's next for Sony Pictures Classics, and, and are you looking to expand, or are you happy with... No, we still have the or? same 25 people we started with who are pretty incredible. Yeah. And a lot of them have been with us for decades, like Dylan and Carmelo and Prasis, and they're all great. And, and literally, the people who work for you have really worked with you for 20 years? Yes, At least. Some. So but we, we also hire a lot of young, we have a lot of young people on our staff to keep us young, like the, right. the 
digital person is very well now there's a you know we have a, the way that we run it is we've got we get great interns as i'm sure you have and the interns that take to the job somebody leaves because we only pay a certain level in certain jobs and that person takes that job and we'll tell them everything we know if you want to go there and learn we'll we'll make sure you at least are going to go away with the knowledge and some people stick some people move on to another place but it keeps everybody in tune with the generation of the moment right and there must be a pleasure in working with both of you so we'll finish with the, with the oscars and how unimportant they are to you 181 181. He knows. I don't know. He does. He pro he's probably saying it's 186. I thought it, but, <laughs> but God. Like 155, but I didn't know. <laughs> no, it's 181. Does that matter to you? No, but obviously it doesn't. Only 155 matter to you. I'll tell you what matters to us is just to make the films work. You know, I I'm going to tell you something. We get asked occasionally to be given awards and so forth. The reason we said yes to this one had to do with the way Christian Jungen put it. We're gonna celebrate your movies, your movies of over 30 years. And Which we're not showing. We want. Well, you're showing a lot of them. Everybody's <laughs> seen them here. This is a very yeah, educated yeah. crowd. Uh, but we have a lot of great movies upcoming. We'll, of course, continue our relationship with Almodovar. We have uh, Living at the end of the year with Bill Nye. We have The Son, which is Florian Zeller's follow-up to The Father. We have a lot of documentaries we're crazy about. You know, the Tanya Tucker one, Hallelujah, about Leonard Cohen, which is just went over a million dollars at the box office. So there's a lot that we're very excited about that's upcoming. This job's a great job. Every, every day is different. Every movie is different. You don't see one a series of the same kind of movies. It's, it's, it takes you into a new world. I mean, searching for Sugar Man, all of a sudden we're on tour with Rodriguez, you know, out of nowhere. Or, you know, we, Kurosawa, we're going to meet him at a hotel and we knock on the door and these three guys answer and all the lights are out and it's lunchtime. And then we go, uh, well, we're here to see, you know, Akiro. He said, well, said no, shh, he's sleeping. And these guys are sitting in the room in the dark waiting for him to wake up. Yeah. And they see come back when he wakes up. You know, that I mean, was a major experience in our life, Kurosawa with Ran, because he introduced us to Steven Spielberg and George Lucas and all these guys. His doctor said he couldn't drink anymore, so he asked us to drink Jack Daniels with for him, and he toured us around the country to sell Ran because he did that because the Japanese did not submit it for the Oscar. It happened then like happens now. Sometimes they submit the wrong film and they were resentful of him. He said, well, I'm going to come to America because the Japanese are small people and I'm like John Wayne, we're going to go. And he sold that movie like crazy and he was nominated for the Oscar for Best Director and we went to the Oscars with him. It was very but, cool. But to go back, he, he would make you drink? He because, would ask us yeah, to drink he, for he, him. He, he asked me, he said, Jack Daniels, you you need to tell the translator, tell him to drink. You drink it, because he couldn't drink anymore. Couldn't drink How many anymore. times a day did you have to do this? We were with him a lot. <laughs> <laughs> At lunchtime, it started. Yeah, San Francisco, wow. LA, New York. And it was incredible. You know, he was honored by the DGA, and he asked us to go with him. These are all war stories, and you'd meet, like, Vincent Minnelli and these people who are, it was the end of their lives. So you're, you're inspired by that when that happens when you're a young person, you know. You know, the directors are, are you know, all the directors, when, when we'd ask a director to do something, we usually are, are there with them, you know, so they can't get mad at flying coach or whatever it is we're, we're trying to do. And so we, we try and stay on the ground with the movie and the people in it because that's that's what we do in those relationships. You know, Bert I, I promise you that they're here. still mad flying coach, even if you're in coach with them. <laughs> Bert Hammerlink is, is here, and the experience we had with Chloe Zhao on yeah. Ryder with him, it was just fantastic. You start with this little film, and it just gets better and better and better and bigger, and, and you feel like you can make a difference for her. He did for her, and, and, and that was a creation of a major filmmaker, major, uh, uh, like she just bloomed, you know? How much, how much time do we have? We're okay? Um, I want to I want to go back on on the state of distribution today because yeah. because when you get, when you when you talk about those journalists that you know the L.A. Times or the New York Times or you know the, the the critics that would actually drive people to to the to the theater 
Um, what do you exactly do differently now than you did before um, to be able to reach that audience? I mean, and well, I mean, look, just looking at, at, at ex exhibition as an example. Yeah. So you, everything that everything you like shows up to you shows up on your internet. If it's a car, it's a food, it's a concert, comes to you. And in the theaters, the most important person and the highest paid person is always the film buyer because he had to choose the right movie and you know negotiate all kinds of deals of people that you know wouldn't play with them. And then they got rid of the sort of blind bidding. So you could play every movie, you could cross the street and it wouldn't matter. That guy became like the least useful guy in there and the most important guy in the, th in the movie theaters is the marketing guy. Well, he's the lowest paid guy. You know, I mean, there's a theater chain that's a major theater chain and you know, the head of marketing came from Radio Shack and another major theater chain, the guy ran a, a string of Red Lobsters. I mean, these are people that haven't grasped the internet. They haven't grasped the way business works. The only guy is this guy in, at Cineplex in Canada who when I saw him the other day, uh, said, you know, I'm going to have the name of every person that saw every movie and I'm going to be able to send them messages because I'm going to know their taste. And that's what Netflix did. You get three in the mail, we'll send you three more and you're going to like these. And they kept the data. And so this theaters are not using the, their data. They're not reaching out to their customers. They're not putting movies back into the conversation. It's starting to slowly happen. But when that happens, it will change over and people will start to go. But right now, just going to the movies is not in the conversation. Like we're doing, you have to do special stuff. We got a, a movie uh, coming out. We had the movie, the, the Duke. We said, okay, people, people aren't going because of COVID. There's like a, a, a risk and a reward. And so we got to figure out how to get over the risk of going to the movie theater. So we said, okay, our campaign is bring your friend back to the movies for free not $3 Tuesday. And so you basically it was a two for one deal and we made it a conversation in the media and we did it with Angelica Cinemas and it was the highest gross in their chain. And you're seeing them grossing more now because they're the one company that's starting to use the internet. They outgross Landmark that in a much smaller that circuit. That a success. That so that's really, it's just getting the movie theaters up to speed with the rest of the industry. And you, you said that, you know, you have to change the way you do business um, every day or every week. And I think that's the reason why I'm still in it. Um, but um, do you believe that theatrical is going to be able to survive this? I mean, you, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. It is. I mean, you look at Spider-Man, you look at those kind of movies that, that, that feeds it. But the theaters need to change and they're, they're slowly changing because in the old days, the, all the advertising and marketing was done by the studios or the distributors, co-op advertising and all that stuff. That's over. And I don't understand why a movie theater who has 500,000 names of people that have seen all their movies couldn't organize that. And, and I would come to them and say, hey, you're in Minneapolis. I'd like to get everyone who's seen a Pedro Almodovar movie to get an email. And I'll pay you for that. Like I would buy a TV spot. They haven't even figured out how to monetize that. That's what the movie phone was going to do. They're going to get all the info and then sell it to them. But, you know, that's where NATO and these guys have to somehow bring this thing into the future, which they will slowly they're, but surely. Different NATO. Yeah, different NATO. Different National NATO. Association of Theater Owners. Yeah. Not the guys uh, no, in the, New York uh, right now. No. I think that, that theatrical will always remain a primary. I think there is no question theatrical is going to survive, that even if the box office is less, the value of theatrical to, for people to remember those titles, for them to do a lot of business. One of the issues I have is if you sell a movie to a streamer and they, they, they put it very at the forefront of their activity for a period of time, but then what happens? It becomes part of an index? What happens? Whereas the theatrical can make it meaningful people for people whether they go to the theaters at that moment or whether they see it later. And so I, there is no question in my mind that theatrical is going to survive. Well, the streamers get your movie and then they put it in the bin and you never see it again. 
our movies will, will go through a cycle of five years where it'll play every format and then bounce back and play it again. So again, that establishes this movie from the theatrical because if you're in the theaters, you get, you get more serious people that pay attention to your movie, you get more serious media, media to deal with your film. And again, it's, it's a major part of the branding process. But the new world order has a lot to do with how the revenues come in. The pie is different now. So when your theatrical is gonna be less than it was, when we started in the business, it was like 80%. Now it's a very small percentage. And basically like with Sony Classics, we have, we, have, we could do a PVOD, three and a half months later is the Amazon Prime, Apple, da da. Seven months later is the first pay. Then there's the second pay with Disney Plus. Then there are all these other platforms that Sony Home Entertainment and Sony Television Disney Plus is exploits. not buying your movies. Okay. Yes, they are. Disney, we have the second pay is Disney Plus and Sony Classics is involved in our movies. Really? Yeah. The other thing is it's a lot cheaper to release a movie now with the internet. That's right. You know, the newspaper ads were insane money. You know, you'd pay $100,000 for a full page. What you could do with $100,000 on the internet is, is a thousand times more than you could with a full page in, in, in a newspaper. Right. And what was explained to me, by the way, about Disney Plus, why they were excited not just to have all the Sony movies, uh, the Columbia movies for the second window, was they have to have a churn every year of movies. And if all these other studios are having platforms that aren't giving them movies, right. they're happy to have this as opposed to like straight to video kind of quality, you know? I have no more questions. Uh, Love it. But, but the audience, anybody? Anybody want to ask a question? I mean, you have Michael Barker and Tom Bernard, and it's rare to have them on stage. Christian has a question. It kind of feels unfair. You can speak to them all the time. Not really. I mean, the studios and the streamers are in LA. You are at, on the East Coast. What's the advantage of working out of New York? It's closer to Europe. It's the center of the media in New York, and it's media that's important for our movies. Also, selfishly, we don't want to leave New York. Well, yeah, our contract says we can't live in L.A. And uh, New York, I think you just get a better feel for the world in New York than you might in L.A. And it makes us a little more distinctive, you know. <laughs> um, any other question that doesn't involve the location of where they live? Patrick? Yeah. Ah, yes. Yes. I love Mike Lee. We had another year, and uh, Mr. Turner, we were co-production partner on that film. But Mike Lee is so rigid, you know. You, never, you basically have to commit to that film on a paragraph. And it was like, okay. What is it about? Yeah, or, yeah. <laughs> but on Mr. Turner, I knew the book he was inspired by. So I used the book and said, okay, this, we look at this short book by Peter Aykroyd. That's a script. And Tom and I said, we're going to do it. Uh, we did it. It was great. But he is very strict in his control, as is, as is Pedro, you know. Um, but they are right because they understand what they do but they also leave to our own devices what we do to our own devices right we changed we changed one poster on pedro which it was the first one on women on the verge of a nervous breakdown he didn't have all the women together and so we kind of cut body parts and put them together to make the poster and the women went berserk <laughs> it's not my legs That's <laughs> it's right. not my dress and, and pedro long, just said i'm don't ever do that again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, nobody. I really covered everything, huh? I know. The only other thing I wanted to mention oh, is God. just the surprises that happen. For example, during the pandemic, there was a moment in the pandemic when we, we got a call from Home Entertainment, and they said, we just want to tell you that the most popular movie during the pandemic in our entire Sony Pictures and Columbia Library is Call Me By Your Name. And we were like, what? He said, that's what's unpredictable about the mo this movie business is that there are these surprises that happen that give longevity to these titles and you kind of have to trust in the quality 
and the fact that that could happen. And it's the culture of the moment. Yeah. I mean, that is the key, I think, to a lot of success for our movies is we, we're buying something that's important in the culture of that moment. Like the movie stardom of Timothy Chalamet. You did make him a movie star. It's all you. But not me, him. Luca and James. Luca. Yep. Well, Luca. Anyway, everybody, Michael Barker, Tom Bernard, brilliant.